Hello everyone and welcome to another video with me 320 Simpilot and today we're going to look at something that again has been requested uh, quite heavily by the community so thank you for all your uh, feedback and input. Today we're talking about charts. How do you use charts to fly a departure in the A320 or pretty much any other airliner? I'm going to use uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator for today but pretty much we're just looking at charts so this will work on uh, any simulator you're using. I'm just going to show you what is important about the charts, what are they trying to tell us uh, and how do we use them uh, when we fly these aircraft. As ever I am a real world Airbus pilot but none of this is for any real world use, it's just to give you some extra context on your home simulations. We are here on runway 27 right at Heathrow about to fly up to Kristiansund in Norway. So let's take a look at how to set up the flight and then what we are going to do with those charts. Today we're focusing on the departure, standard instrument departure or SID charts. Right, let's get started. Here we are on the flight planner page. I've chosen my A320neo from Heathrow to Christiansund in Norway. I'm going to depart from runway 27 right uh, and now we need to choose our departure. Now the magic of Flight Simulator's planning tool is that you can simply select your uh, runway and then it will give you the departures for that runway 27 right this is really great tool and it's really useful and it's going to show how useful it is when we go to our charts but anyway uh, these will work from 27 right but if i choose the wrong one for example uh, max it that goes off to the south and we don't want to go to the south so uh, you can keep looking through i happen to know that brookman's park uh, is going to be the one for us today because that's going to take us up to the north and then en route so that's a pretty efficient way so there we go Two seven right, Britain's Park, seven box shot, and now we will jump onto the airplane and have a look at uh, the charts. Here we are on the flight deck now of two seven right at Heathrow, and we are ready to depart off to Christiansand. But what we're going to do is look at the charts. Now, of course, the charts are not something we would be discussing here on the flight deck. These would have been pre-briefed. We'd have done them before we started engines. We'd have looked through, set up the computers, and so on. But for today, we'll do that uh, here at the threshold, the magic of flight simulator. So. Uh, let's bring up those charts and have a look at what we are planning to do. So here is our Navigraph and I'm going to use Navigraph for uh, this video today. That's what I use for my charts. It is a subscription service. There are free alternatives available in most countries. They're provided by the local authorities. Uh, so it is usually possible to get charts for free but I'm using Navigraph which are based on Jefferson charts and we'll see what that means. So if you're using Navigraph as well you can uh, I've already entered a route in flight uh, and I've put it in uh, as a, a manual flight it's pretty straightforward but anyway I've not got any of the on route waypoints. I can click on my airport and opens charts list alternatively you can type it in up here uh, and you'll get the same same result. So let's go to Heathrow and open the chart list there. Right, so we are looking at departure charts today and all I have to do is you've got the star, standard terminal arrival, approach chart, taxi chart, SID, standard instrument departure chart and then reference charts. So let's go to SID and we said Brookman's Park, 7 Foxtrot and here it is. So as I said, this is based on the Jefferson chart, which is what we've got at the top. There are other formats, but they'll all pretty much give you the same information. So if you can read one, you'll have a good chance of reading another. Just some information may be displayed in a, a different way. I do occasionally find myself struggling as I swap between the different ones, but you'll, you'll generally get the idea. So what is this and why do we have to use it? This is a standard instrument departure. This is what IFR, Instrument Flight Rule Aircraft, will use departing uh, busy airports, or most airports really. In commercial airliner flying, especially around Europe, this is what you're going to use all the time. You will nearly always depart using a standard instrument departure of some variety. It enables us to take off and go into clouds almost immediately and still safely navigate our way out. So why can't we just take off and head straight to Brookman's Park? Because we're going from Brookman's Park and then we have our flight plan all the way up to uh, Norway. So why can't we just take off and go direct there? What's the problem? Well, first of all, this is a busy airport, Heathrow. Uh, so you have to have a route that separates you from arriving traffic as well. Now they'll be formatted for the whichever way the wind is blowing on the day, but we're departing off the westerly runways, so there'll be traffic arriving in uh, onto the westerly runways over here to the east of the airport. So this route takes us around, keeps us flying straight ahead for a bit, and then turning around and clear and away. And they'll all be coordinated to do that. Secondly, it keeps us clear of terrain. You can see on the charts, it shows you your MSA based on the London VOR, 2,100 feet, that is shown here. It's uh, 2,200 feet in this sector, and they've drawn the lines here to show you where the difference is based around this London VOR. So that means we are safe as long as we are above 2,100 feet. Now, that is uh, true, 
the problem is, of course, when we take off, we're starting off at 80 feet or whatever the elevation is of your airport. So how are we going to be safe as we climb up? Well, that is how we are safe. We follow this route. It gives us terrain clearance whilst we're following it. Now, that is important because it means we need to actually follow this route until we're safe before we turn off it. But we're only going to do that with air traffic control's permission. Air traffic control may be able to give us a different routing earlier that is also safe, but that's a different story. So the chart gives us traffic separation and it gives us terrain separation. So it's a safe way to get an aircraft into the air um, whilst uh, also keeping us uh, in the, the flow of, uh, of the aircraft around the area. So that is why we are going to use this chart and that's why it's useful for you to learn. If you're going to be joining into that sim or any other sort of network uh, or you just want to simulate flying airliners uh, realistically, this is a departure that you'll need to fly or any sort of standard instrument departure from your airport. A traffic control will tell you the one you're going to use so don't worry if you don't know there's a long list here but air traffic control will advise you so when you start out i recommend don't get too bogged down um, thinking about your flight plan yourself i know that my flight plan starts at brookman's park that is the route i've got i've got london heathrow and i'm going to go from brookman's park onwards the standard instrument departure will be up to air traffic control you can see there's two options on this chart alone there's the seven golf the seven foxtrot uh, and there's also from the other runways different Brookman's Park departures. So what our traffic will do is clear you for the Brookman's Park departure that takes you up there and matches the runway they want you to use. There can be different ones but like I said so when you're starting out just let air traffic control tell you which one you should expect. You can even ask them before you get your clearance. That's another possibility. And I've done that many times in real life. You just call up and you say which departure can we expect. Just if you're not sure if there's several going the same way. But here we go. So choose the right one from the left. Brookman's Park 7 Fox Shot today, as we said. And let's figure out what we want to take away from it. So to start off with, quite obviously, it is a lateral navigation path. It is a, a route over the ground for us to follow. And it is uh, very, very descriptive about what it wants us to do. So we can see it visually. First of all, I can see here, I've got a takeoff from 27 right, Brookman's Park 7 Fox Shot, to D3 London. That is DME 3, so 3 miles from the London VOR. This VOR gives us a distance readout. When we are 3 miles away, I'm going to turn right and track 298 until 4 miles from the London VOR. And then I'm going to keep going until I'm at 6 miles from the London VOR on this 298 towards the Burnham NDB. So, as we said, take it off, then make your right turn, intercept this 298 inbound to Burnham, and then at six miles from the London VOR, we make a right turn around up towards Chiltern NDB and we intercept the 054 inbounds to Chiltern. Now, if I'm confusing you by saying inbound radials NDBs, don't worry, I have a tra tracking tutorial on the channel where I look at VOR and NDB tracking. But most importantly, when you're starting out, you do not need to worry about that. You will be able to use the lateral navigation in the airplane to fly this but we have to as commercial airline pilots when we're out flying we have the backup ready to go we, we know what we're trying to achieve this is also notable for being a standard instrument departure that uses radio nav aids a lot of them don't these days so we'll talk about that later so after we are tracking up towards the Chilton NEB we leave it on 064 outbound track and that takes us to Brookman's Park and that is the end of the departure because from that point onwards we are flying our flight plan waypoint to waypoint. So there you go. The tracks you're going to follow or the inbound radials are always written on the chart there. So I can see it's 298. So I'm tracking 298 up towards this NDB. So I need to intercept that radial or that inbound track to that NDB. Then I intercept the 054 inbound to the Chilton NDB and then I take the 064 outbound. Again, my tracking tutorial covers all of that. But that's what it's telling us. That's what those numbers mean. They are uh, the degrees and the, the track that we need to follow. It's showing us a VOR here, then an NDB, and then another NDB. And it gives you the frequency you need written quite clearly, which is great. And also underneath is the Morse code ident. In the Airbus, we are quite lucky. I'll show you. In the Airbus, if I want to display an NDB, I can put that to the left uh, and then we'll tune it in. So our chart said 421 for the Burnham. Uh, I don't want to spend too long on tuning and tracking, but let's put in the 421 into our RADNAV, ADF-1, 421. And in the real aircraft, it would then bring up the name. It would change over to, say, Burr, and you can see that it's been identified. Same for the London VOR. Now, I'm not sure of that feature. There you go. You can see it down there, Burr, 
Um, so it, it sort of works and there's no DME readout because it doesn't have it. But there you go. So that is the lateral part. It's also written in plain text at the bottom. So choose the correct runway, 27 right for us today. Uh, obviously 27 left would be the Brookman's Park 7 Golf. And then it reads it out for you. So you could actually get away without looking at the chart. Climb straight ahead, intercept 298 bearing towards Burnham by 4 miles from London. At 6 miles from London, make a right turn, intercept the 054 bearing towards Chilton. Cross London radial 305 at or above 4000. Uh, and on it goes. So what's it talking about there, crossing? So this is the next part of the departure. It's the vertical profile. We said this keeps us safe from terrain, but it does rely on us climbing at a certain rate. You can actually see some of the uh, compliance written down here. Don't get too bogged down with that. So we need to, after takeoff, we can follow all of this. But what's notable is this radial, the 305, which we'll be able to tell when we cross. When we pass this point on this route, we must be above 4,000 and below 6,000 feet. The line above means you need to be below it. The line below needs you mean, means you need to be above it. So we need to be above 4,000 below 6,000. It's like a sandwich between 6 and 4,000. We can be at 4,000 and we can be at 6,000. That would both be acceptable. By the next radial, by crossing this 326 point, the 326 Gulf, we need to be above 5,000. So the, the floor of our sandwich has increased, as you can see. So that we need to be above 5, below 6. Finally, at the Chilton NDB, the sandwich is very restricted. It must be at 6,000 feet. And then at Brookman's Park, must be at 6,000 feet. Now this is to do with uh, terrain, but also, you know, we can tell we're safe from terrain by the time we're at 5,000 feet in this area. So this would probably be an air traffic control restriction on aircraft coming into other airports, London being very busy, a whole lot of airports around here. So there you go. So that is a vertical profile. So when you're going to go flying, as I said, you can tune this all and you could fly it all yourself using the VORs and the NDBs as entirely possible. But what I'm going to do now is just uh, look into the FMGC if I can get it all on the screen for you, that would be uh, really good. And if you go to plan up here and zoom in on the scale, you can see on this screen our uh, route. And there it is. Looks pretty reasonable. Looks about the same sort of picture. So again, we check it very carefully in real life. Um, but in the simulator, you might be tempted to uh, just look at the shape and check it's roughly right. If we zoom in, what we can see, uh, let me try and bring that up for you. I can maybe do it this way. I'll bring up that navigation display for you. What I can see here is, as we scroll through, saying the range doesn't go any lower, um, but I can also see it down here on the FMGC. Let's go to this view. Uh, right, there we go. <laughs> so, um, there we go, we've got D1, then we've got London 4 miles, remember that point? London 6 miles, you'll remember that one, by which point we make that right turn, uh, and then we take the 305 uh, out up towards the or we cross, sorry, the radial 305, then we cross the radial 326, and then we get to Chilton. Uh, so you can see Brookman's Park after that. So these waypoints, this is a bug in the way Microsoft Flight Simulator does its lateral navigation. They aren't perfect, but you can see it's pretty much right. We've got our four mile London, our six mile London, and this is called radial 305 and radial 326, only because, if I bring back the chart, uh, that is the point we cross the 305 and we cross the 326. So that's all it's telling us there. So I can tell that's pretty much right. We can then back it up if we want to. We could tune in the radio navigation aids. As I said, we could put in our NDB. We could put in the Chilton NDB. And we could put in the London uh, VOR. So we have ways to back up everything that's happening. That way, if the aircraft uh, has a problem with its navigation, I can still do it using the needles. Again, watch my tracking tutorial for help on that. So we've successfully checked our altitudes sorry we've checked our routing on here and we've checked the altitude we know that by Chilton we want to be at 6,000 feet let us jump back into the uh, cockpit and if we bring up those charts again what else do we need to set up so you can tune in your navigation aids as we just did and we can also tune in our vertical altitude so we know the first altitude we're going to climb to is 6,000 feet because you can see that first restriction is 6,000 uh, the next one is or sorry above four below six above five below six and then six and six so 6,000 is safe we can go straight up to six no problem so what I'm going to do for that is tune in 6,000 which is what we've got 6,000 on here 
you can see I've clicked constraints on the EFIS control. That shows me the vertical constraints on this SID on this uh, navigation display. It doesn't work very accurately in Flight Simulator. You need your charts really to know the proper restrictions at the moment. But that's where they would appear. It would say above four, above five, above six, or at six. Uh, the airplane has it all in its databases in the in the real aircraft. Good stuff. So what else can we take away from this chart then? Well, th there's loads of information on here. As I said, this is a radio navigation aid sort of uh, departure. So this is a standard uh, uh, SID, as it were, um, if there is such a thing. So what that means is you could fly this without any sort of uh, FMS or IRS navigation system or GPS. There are other ones that require those to be included, but we'll talk about those later. So what else is on the chart that's useful? Well, it will have an effective date. So this was made on the 30th of November 2018. It became effective on the 6th of December. So that's because in the old days when you had paper charts, the charts would be added to the airplane early as a backup or not a backup, but ready. Uh, but you couldn't use them until the effective date. So you had to make sure both of those were true. These days with iPads, most people update their charts, uh, you know, electronically. So it's not as um, as critical as it once but it is still critical but the apps tend to only show you the valid charts things like that and then we got our london control frequency this is going to be the frequency we use after departure so 118825 airport elevation 83 feet so when we're on our q and h we should see 83 feet i can see 80 feet so that is a, a good sensibility check that you have the right q and h when you get set up over here we have transition altitude 6000 so that means up to 6,000 feet, we're flying on the Q&H, and therefore we level off at altitudes. Anything above this, and it would be a flight level. So if the air traffic wanted us to go to 7,000 feet, it wouldn't be 7,000 feet. It would be flight level 70. So that is the last altitude on the climb, the transition altitude. And that does not change. That will, That's why it's printed on the chart. You can see the note 1, when instructed, contact London Control after takeoff, report call sign, SID designator, current altitude, and initial cleared altitude. So again, if you're starting out on VATSIM, that's a great little prompt there for what you're going to need to tell them. It says, when instructed, contact London Control. So we will go to this frequency when Tower Control tells us to. At that point, when we check in with that frequency, we will report our call sign, the departure, the SID designator, which in this case is Brookmans Park 7 Foxtrot, current altitude, for example, 2,300 feet, or you'd say passing 2,300 feet usually, uh, climbing 6,000 feet. Uh, then it tells us that the SID includes noise preferential routes, so that's something important I should have mentioned. These are often designed as well to avoid noise sensitive areas. So there'll be places like Manchester where you'll see the departure wobbles all over the place and there's no terrain, there's nothing, but there are some houses below that don't want to hear the noise of the airplanes. So that is why these departures are used. That's why you'll also find at night and daylight, you'll sometimes have departures used specifically for night or day. It can be noise abatement procedure reasons, um, or it could be um, for uh, terrain visual reasons. There's all sorts. But like I said, there could be several departures going to Brookmans Park from the same runway. You just go with the one that their traffic tells you because they'll, they'll have their own reasons. Cruising levels be issued after takeoff, that's fine, and do not climb above SID levels until instructed. That is important. We can climb up to 6,000 feet and, unless told otherwise because that's what the departures cleared us for. So if air traffic control clears us for the Brookmans Park 7 Foxtrot departure, we can go to 6,000 feet. We don't need to ask them. They would then have to clear us higher. Even after we're past this end of Brookmans Park, we need to get clearance from air traffic control to go higher. Good. Then we've got obviously the designators uh, for this chart. It shows you which ones are on the chart. So just the 7 Foxtrot and 7 Golf today. Speed max 250 knots below flight level 100 unless otherwise authorized. Very common in uh, the world below flight level 100 to be 250 knots or less. Over here we have a little lost comms box. It tells us comply with the route and altitude restrictions of the SID. Very important but that's what we would do if we lose all radio communications incredibly rare incredibly rare these days we have three radios on the airbus at least so it's unusual for you to lose all ability to contact tower um, but there it is lost comms it may not be your fault it could be that the frequency becomes blocked or they have trouble receiving or anything like that so that's what you're going to do you're going to carry on with your route and altitude restrictions on the sit it gives you the track mileage to britman's park just a, an awareness thing and it tells you warning do uh, due to interaction, do not climb above 6,000 until cleared. Pretty normal. No turns below 590 feet. Fine. We talked about this MSA. It's warning us about the terrain. Another little interesting thing here is this little arrow. This points to the highest obstacle on the chart. So this is pointing to a 1,087-foot obstacle over here. Um, so that is what that's for. 
um, and it just highlights it for your awareness. More important on approach charts, which we'll talk about another day. As we come down here, it talks about noise monitoring. Again, you just want to follow the departure and fly your company procedures. That's how you should avoid the noise typically. But it does say uh, it, you require to maintain a climb gradient of 4% up to 4,000 feet. You'll notice that they also tell you what vertical feet per minute rate you will need. So that's the vertical speed you will require depending on your ground speed. So if we take off and shortly after takeoff we're doing 200 knots, then I need to climb at at least 800 feet per minute to maintain 4%. That is easy in a modern twin jet airliner, very easy. But on single engines, maybe not. If you had an engine failure on takeoff, you may not make this restriction. In that case, we may not make these altitude restrictions here. So what are we going to do? Well, we just tell air traffic control that we're not going to make them. These departures are usually safe for an engine failure. So typically, if you have an engine failure whilst taking off, you can still fly the SID, the standard instrument departure. If you can't, your company will have special published procedures for that airport and that departure. It's called an emergency turn procedure. But if there is none, then you are safe to fly on this departure usually. It will depend slightly on uh, your company's setup. And there we go, and then we get down to the bottom and our routing. We talked about our stop altitude of 6,000 feet. Sometimes this will be written along the bottom here, so it will say cleared initial, initial cleared altitude 6,000 feet, or sometimes a flight level, initial cleared flight level. And that's it. That is the standard instrument departure chart. Lots of information on there, um, but you'll recognize it all, and uh, it does tend to be the same between different charts, uh, or very similar formatting anyway. What I want to do now, talking about the vertical profile, is show you a different set of vertical profile. So we're going to use the London Gatwick chart. So now we are looking at the departure from London Gatwick. We are looking at the Invert 1 Zulu. So a few differences about this chart that make it quite interesting. And this is something you may see when you go to load up your charts. Uh, we have different labeled waypoints. You can see the, the names. Instead of being based on distances from a VOR, it's just written KKE05, KKN09, KKW19. And you'll notice that there's no VOR, there's no tuning to do, there's no um, NDB or anything like that. It's just these points and you get tracks and distances between them in sort of very direct lines. The same result is that we end up at Inver, which would be our departure point if we were using, for example, this flight plan. So if your departure, if you knew your flight plan started at Inver, then you could expect something like this if you're departing from this runway. So why is it like this? Well, this, if you look at the top, is an RNAV or uh, GNSS or DME DME departure runway 08 right. So what does that mean? RNAV is area navigation and it is a way of navigating the aircraft without having to have radio navigate on the ground. Why is that advantageous? Well what it does is it means they can just place these waypoints wherever they want. You would have seen in the earlier chart out of Heathrow that those points all had to be based around radio navigation aids and so on but now you can just draw a string and airplanes will follow it. These points are defined by their latitude and longitude coordinates, so they're just literally a point in place, space, you can put them anywhere, and the aeroplane can fly directly to it because the aeroplane knows where it is over the uh, face of planet Earth, it, it knows its position. How does it know its position? Well, we use IRSs, gyroscopes in the uh, Airbus or ring laser gyros these days that allow us to know where we are. That's what we do when we align the IRSs. It's not too important, but my point being, in a fully serviceable Airbus, you are easily able to fly an RNAV departure. What it says is DME, DME, or GNSS. So GNSS is GPS, so you could use GPS to navigate to each of these points if you were in a smaller airplane that didn't have the IRS system, uh, or you can use DME, DME. What that means is, there are lots of DMEs based on VORs all over the place. So let's say there's the London VOR and then further south we've got uh, actually the Biggin Hill VOR. The airplane can sense its distance to each of these using the DME equipment it has built into it. And it draws rings around them and then it can pinpoint exactly where it is and it's very accurate. So using a system like that we can figure out where we are. So anyway, that allows us to navigate without having to use uh, radials and distances and so on. That just works in the background. The airplane knows where it is. We follow the green line and it flies past these waypoints. There's no backup on these. If we lose GPS and we lose our airplane's navigation capability, then we, and we can only fly headings, we can't tune a VOR and follow this. That It doesn't have that option. Um, but that's very rare. And anyway, air traffic control can give you headings in that case. I'm sure they wouldn't mind. It's, let's face it, this isn't the most complicated departure. So there you go. That's the first difference. You get these funny names because they're not being written in the same way. And you get uh, these warning at the top, RNAV or uh, 
DME, sorry, RNF, brackets, DME, DME, GNSS. Next step is that these stop altitudes, what do you notice is different about them this time? So it's got the routing written at the bottom, doesn't have our stop altitude written at the bottom, but it does say above 2,500, below 3,000 here, and then it says at 3,000, at 3,000, and finally at 4,000. So you've got to watch out. If we were cleared to fly this departure by air traffic control, then we would take off, we would level off at 3,000 feet initially, that's what I would put in my uh, FCU window, that's what I would put on the aircraft. Level off at 3,000, after this waypoint, the KKW19, I need to climb to 4. So leaving this point, I'll climb 4,000 feet and be level for inver. So it's a bit of a strange one. It's quite rare, but it does happen. So you need to be aware that you could have a step climb. So if air traffic control cleared us for this departure, they would expect us to climb, level at 3, and then climb to 4. Finally, there is speed constraints, 220 knots, so you would check that your airplane is going to fly at 220 knots around these turns, uh, and if you are heavy, you might need to leave some flaps out, but that's a, another topic. But there we go, so speed restriction 220, 220, 250. So if you have a departure with a tight turn at the start of it, it is quite common to see speed restrictions. Normally, they are designed so that you don't go too far through these waypoints. And there you go. Same sort of notes up here, transition altitude, the London control frequency for this one. It says RNF1, uh, meaning we need to be RNF1 capable, which the Airbus very much is, and it tells you some of the equipment you might need, uh, and also um, critical nav aids, things like that. But it's it's pretty much the same stuff. Don't get too bogged down with all the text in here. <laughs> uh, warning steps climb, it does give you a warning. Steps climb meaning that 3,000 feet to 4,000 feet, which is why you must follow it, and no turns below 7, 10 feet in this case. And here's our lateral routing written along the bottom. So there you go, a slightly different style of chart. You'll notice the MSAs are divided into four sections here. So you've got 2,000 feet in this quadrant, 2,300 feet over here. So when we depart, initially we are safe above 2,300 feet in this area. And then by the time we turn left, we're safe above 2,200 feet. And then by the time we're in this sector, we're safe above 2,100 feet. If we jump back into our Brookman's Park departure, you'll see the difference using all these radials, nav aids, and so on. But at the top, there's no RNAV or anything like that written, no requirement for that sort of equipment. You could fly this in a Cessna, pretty much, <laughs> and it would be absolutely fine. But these days, RNAVs are becoming more and more common. They're very popular for the obvious reason that with an RNAV departure, you can put the, the route wherever you want. You can avoid houses and so on all very easily, whereas these have to be um, described by these, these radial nav aids. So that's pretty much it for the Brookman's Park departure uh, out of Heathrow. So let's look at a different one. What I'm going to do now is bring up an Amsterdam chart. So that is uh, EHAM. And we're going to see some differences because sometimes you have to do a bit of investigating when you look at these charts to, to get the right idea. So now we are going to look at the Amsterdam Andic departure. So what's different about this chart? Well, we can uh, see the usual information at the top, the departure frequency. But what you will notice is airport elevation minus 11, of course, Amsterdam below sea level, very unusual. Transition altitude very low, 3,000 feet. So if we look down at our departure, you'll see initial climb clearance, flight level 60. So this is important. Uh, our vertical profile in here, we've got to be above 500 feet. Let's say we're departing off this runway. But by the time we reach Andic, we've got to be above flight level 95. So you can see that it's got the restrictions, but it doesn't tell us what altitude to climb to. Above 500, above 95, but there's no other information. Same for this departure here. There's a speed limit, but when are we supposed to, or where are we supposed to stop our climb? Well, here we go. Initial climb clearance, flight level 60. So the information should be on the chart somewhere. If you're not sure, if you're nervous, or you haven't found it, ask air traffic controller and they'll tell you. Uh, and any decent air traffic controller will have more than enough, uh, be happy enough to tell you. Um, but uh, yeah, it should be on the chart in one of those places we've seen. You can see the usual description down here. But another thing, this is a flight level 60. We need to take off on the Q&H. At some point after takeoff, when we've accelerated and cleaned up, or even above acceleration altitude, you can then change it to standard to 1013. Uh, or in the Airbus, of course, we, uh, standard is all we have to set. Uh, and then uh, you'll be climbing up to your flight level. Finally then, a note up here, remain on tower frequency until passing 2,000 feet, then contact sheeple departure. So this is called an automatic changeover. Here we can change from our tower frequency to the departure frequency. Uh, we'll do that after passing 2,000 feet on our own. Tower will not tell us to contact departure. We are expected to do it. Now that's in real life. In VATSIM, 
I don't think this happens very often. I don't know how many, how often they have these uh, this many controllers online. I'm not sure, but uh, that is the that is what that means. That's why it uh, has an automatic changeover. You can go digging for more information. You can see it says refer to 10-3B, which is uh, it, I think it's uh, yeah it's in here. You get more departure instructions. They give you a bit more information if you want to read that and do things uh, very properly. So uh, last chart to look at for today, we're looking at Milan Lenate. Uh, and if, here we have the different departures, including the Trevi 6 Delta from runway 18. So Milan, very near the Alps. So we have the uh, terrain restrictions. You'll see these high MSAs, 10,100 feet. Some notable things about this departure are, um, well, at first it tells you SID is noise abatement routing, so you must adhere to it. But if you look, this one we can fly, we've got our um, NDBs tracking and so on, tracking up to VORs, so it's a traditional departure. But look, we can go above 840 and not before 2.2 uh, DME from the LIN VOR, and then we've got above 3,000 feet, above 5,000 feet, above level 95. So where do we stop? Well, I'll look at the bottom. Oh, it doesn't say. Okay, we need to get that information from air traffic control. So be clear that the cleared attitude should be very obvious. And if it isn't, you need to get it from air traffic control. Uh, and like I say, if you're not sure, ask them. It's quite likely on this departure that you could be cleared up to a flight level or something that's below the safe altitude or even below 9.5 uh, as it was out of Amsterdam. So we need to get further clearance on this leg to climb. Um, but that'll be air traffic's problem. However, for the terrain restrictions or uh, you know i'd be worried about terrain so i would make sure i get that climb to make sure i'm safe from the terrain that's my responsibility terrain separation is, is our problem air traffic control will try and do it but it's very much our job to make sure we speak up if we are concerned about terrain so there we go it's just a slightly different chart as you can see they've also divided up the msa so 4200 feet up until 15 miles from the linate vor and then it's 10,100 feet for the rest up until 25. These range rings, it says around the Lin VOR, usually they're 25 miles. It seems to be a pretty standard sort of format, but it does vary, so you need to make sure you're aware of that. Here's our climb gradient. For this one, you'll notice it requires 6.5%, so more than London, which means that at 200 knots, we need to be doing 1,300, at least, or slightly over 1,300 feet per minute. Again, no problem in a modern aircraft, but there you go. And there's our lateral routing at the bottom. So that's all for today's video. I hope it's been useful for you. It's uh, a topic that people have asked about a lot. I'm going to do more charts showing, especially, obviously, the approach charts and the arrival charts, because that is going to be the, the next step <laughs> that you guys will want to do. But hopefully this helps you if you want to fly a SID, a standard instrument departure on that sim in your flight simulator. Or even if you're not doing it on that sim, just to practice flying those charts uh, and flying the departures properly in your, your home flight simulator. As I said, we fly these departures uh, in the A320 or any commercial airliner on an IFR flight. You will always fly a SID pretty much. They are, they are nearly always used. So it really is something that's worth having a, a good grasp of so that you can take it on into your home flight simulations. There'll be plenty more videos to come, live streams as well coming soon on the channel. So do please subscribe if you like this contact content. Sorry, We've got plenty more guides coming. Uh, and uh, yeah, we will see you again in another video or live stream soon. Thank you. Bye bye.